Civil Peace by Shinwa Achebe Short Story Background In 1967, Nigeria entered a civil war when the country's southeastern territories declared independence, calling themselves the Republic of Biafra. The Biafrans, most of whom belonged to the Igbo ethnic group, said they broke away from Nigeria because another ethnic group, called the Hausa, had massacred Igbo in the north. After nearly three years of war, the Biafrans surrendered. More than one million people had died in battle or from starvation. Civil peace unfolds in the aftermath of this war. About the author Shinwa Achebe, born 1930, died 2013, is renowned for novels and stories that explore the conflicts of modern Africa. He was born into the Nigerian Igbo tribe and publicly supported the independence of the Igbo-dominated Biafra region from Nigeria. Considered the founding father of modern African literature in the English language, Achebe is read widely in Africa and around the world. His first and most celebrated novel, Things Fall Apart, portrays the disruption of Igbo tribal society by Western colonialism. Civil Peace by Shinwa Achebe Jonathan Awembu counted himself extraordinarily lucky. Happy survival meant so much more to him than just a current fashion of greeting old friends in the first hazy days of peace. It went deep to his heart. He had come out of the war with five inestimable blessings, his head, his wife Maria's head, and the heads of three out of their four children. As a bonus, he also had his old bicycle, a miracle too, but naturally not to be compared to the safety of five human heads. The bicycle had a little history of its own. One day at the height of the war, it was commandeered for urgent military action. Hard as its loss would have been to him, he would still have let it go without a thought, had he not had some doubts about the genuineness of the officer. It wasn't his disreputable rags, nor the toes peeping out of one blue and one brown canvas shoe, nor yet the two stars of his rank, done obviously in a hurry in Biro, that troubled Jonathan. Many good and heroic soldiers looked the same or worse. It was, rather, a certain lack of grip and firmness in his manner. So Jonathan, suspecting he might be amenable to influence, rummaged in his raffia bag and produced the two pounds with which he had been going to buy firewood, which his wife, Maria, retailed to camp officials for extra stockfish and cornmeal, and got his bicycle back. That night... He buried it in the little clearing in the bush where the dead of the camp, including his own youngest son, were buried. When he dug it up again a year later after the surrender, all it needed was a little palm oil greasing. Nothing puzzles God, he said in wonder. He put it to immediate use as a taxi and accumulated a small pile of Biafran money faring camp officials and their families across the four-mile stretch to the nearest tarred road. His standard charge per trip was six pounds, and those who had the money were only glad to be rid of some of it in this way. At the end of a fortnight, he had made a small fortune of 115 pounds. Then he made the journey to Enugu and found another miracle waiting for him. It was unbelievable. He rubbed his eyes and looked again, and it was still standing there before him. But, needless to say, even that monumental blessing must be accounted also totally inferior to the five heads in the family. This newest miracle was his little house in Ogui Overside. Indeed, nothing puzzles God. Only two houses away, a huge concrete edifice some wealthy contractor had put up just before the war, was a mountain of rubble. And here was Jonathan's little zinc house of no regrets, built with mud blocks, quite intact. Of course, the doors and windows were missing, and five sheets off the roof, but what was that? And anyhow, he had returned to Anugu early enough to pick up bits of old zinc and wood and soggy sheets of cardboard lying around the neighborhood before thousands more came out of their forest holes looking for the same things. He got a destitute carpenter with one old hammer, a blunt plane, and a few bent and rusty nails in his tool bag 
to turn this assortment of wood, paper, and metal into door and window shutters for five Nigerian shillings or fifty Biafran pounds. He paid the pounds and moved in with his overjoyed family carrying five heads on their shoulders. His children picked mangoes near the military cemetery and sold them to soldiers' wives for a few pennies, real pennies this time, and his wife started making breakfast acara balls for neighbors in a hurry to start life again. With his family earnings, he took his bicycle to the villages around and bought fresh palm wine, which he mixed generously in his rooms, with the water which had recently started running again in the public tap down the road, and opened up a bar for soldiers and other lucky people with good money. At first he went daily, then every other day, and finally once a week to the offices of the Coal Corporation where he used to be a miner, to find out what was what. The only thing he did find out in the end was that that little house of his was even a greater blessing than he had thought. Some of his fellow ex-miners who had nowhere to return at the end of the day's waiting just slept outside the doors of the offices and cooked what meal they could scrounge together in bon vita tins. As the weeks lengthened and still nobody could say what was what, Jonathan discontinued his weekly visits altogether and faced his palm wine bar. But nothing puzzles God. Came the day of the windfall, when after five days of endless scuffles in queues and counter queues in the sun outside the treasury, he had twenty pounds counted into his palms as ex gratia award for the rebel money he had turned in. It was like Christmas for him, and for many others like him, when the payments began. They called it, since few could manage its proper official name, Egg Rasha. As soon as the pound notes were placed in his palm, Jonathan simply closed it tight over them and buried fist and money inside his trouser pocket. He had to be extra careful because he had seen a man a couple of days earlier collapse into near madness in an instant before that oceanic crowd because no sooner had he got his twenty pounds then some heartless ruffian picked it off him, though it was not right that a man in such an extremity of agony should be blamed, yet many in the queues that day were able to remark quietly at the victim's carelessness, especially after he pulled out the innards of his pocket and revealed a hole in it big enough to pass a thief's head. But of course, he had insisted that the money had been in the other pocket, pulling it out too, to show its comparative wholeness, so one had to be careful. Jonathan soon transferred the money to his left hand and pocket, so as to leave his right free for shaking hands, should the need arise, though by fixing his gaze at such an elevation as to miss all approaching human faces, he made sure that the need did not arise until he got home. He was normally a heavy sleeper, but that night, he heard all the neighborhood noises die down one after another. Even the night watchman, who knocked the hour on some metal somewhere in the distance, had fallen silent after knocking one o'clock. That must have been the last thought in Jonathan's mind before he was finally carried away himself. He couldn't have been gone for long, though, when he was violently awakened again. Who is knocking? whispered his wife, lying beside him on the floor. I don't know, he whispered back breathlessly. The second time the knocking came, it was so loud and imperious that the rickety old door could have fallen down. Who is knocking? he asked them, his voice parched and trembling. Natif man and him people, came the cool reply. Make you open the door. This was followed by the heaviest knocking of all. Maria was the first to raise the alarm. Then he followed, and all their children. Police all! Thieves all! Neighbors all! Police all! We are lost! We are dead! Neighbors, are you asleep? Wake up! Police all! This went on for a long time, and then stopped suddenly. Perhaps they had scared the thief away. There was total silence, but only for a short while. You done finish? asked the voice outside. Make we help you small. Oh yeah, everybody. 
Police, thief man, neighbors, oh, we the law, so police. There are at least five other voices besides the leaders. Jonathan and his family were now completely paralyzed by terror. Maria and the children sobbed inaudibly like lost souls. Jonathan groaned continuously. The silence that followed the thieves' alarm vibrated horribly. Jonathan all but begged their leader to speak again and be done with it. My friend, said he at long last, we don't try our best for call them, but I think say them all the sleep all. So, what can we go do now? Some time you want call soldier? Or you want make we call them for you? Soldier better pass police, no be so? No so, replied his men. Jonathan thought he heard even more voices now than before, and groaned heavily. His legs were sagging under him, and his throat felt like sandpaper. My friend, why you know they talk again? I dare ask you, say, you want make we call soldier? No. All right, oh, now make we talk business. We no be bad thief. We no like for big trouble. Trouble done finish. War done finish, and all the katakata way they fall inside. No civil war again. This time not civil peace. No be so? No so, answered the horrible chorus. What do you want from me? I am a poor man. Everything I had went with this war. Why do you come to me? You know people who have money. We all right. We no say you no got plenty money, but we sell, give us one hundred pound, and we go come out. Otherwise, we they come for inside now, to show you guitar boy like this. A volley of automatic fire rang through the sky. Maria and the children began to weep aloud again. Ah, oh, Miss Sissy, they cry again. No need for that. We don't talk say we not good teeth. We just take our small money and go no way only. No molest. I be we de molest at all, sang the chorus. My friends, began Jonathan hoarsely, I hear what you say, and I thank you. If I had one hundred pounds, look at my friend, no be play. We come play for your house. If we make mistake and step for inside, you no go like Amo, so therefore, to God who made me, if you come inside and find one hundred pounds, take it, and shoot me, and shoot my wife, and children, I swear to God, the only money I have in this life is this twenty pounds egg rasher they gave me today. Okay, time they go, make you open this window, and bring the twenty pound. We go manage them like that. There were now loud murmurs of dissent among the chorus. No lie, the man, the lie. He got plenty money. Make we go inside and search properly well. Wouldn't be twenty pound. Shoot up! rang the leader's voice like a lone shot in the sky and silenced the murmuring at once. Are you there? Bring the money quick. I am coming said Jonathan, fumbling in the darkness with the key of the small wooden box he kept by his side on the mat. At the first sign of light, as neighbors and others assembled to commiserate with him, he was already strapping his five-gallon demijohn to his bicycle carrier, and his wife, sweating in the open fire, was turning over a car of balls in a wide clay bowl of boiling oil. In the corner, his eldest son was rinsing out dregs of yesterday's palm wine from old beer bottles. I count it as nothing, he told his sympathizers, his eyes on the rope he was tying. What is egg rasher? Did I depend on it last week? Or is it greater than other things that went with the war? I say, let egg rasher perish in the flames. Let it go where everything else has gone. Nothing puzzles God.